Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for for joining us here this afternoon. Uh, my name is Kristen Young, and I just want to welcome you to our virtual series here today. Um, this is our seventh and final series of virtual conversations that we're providing for leadership educators. We've had over 2,300 people register to engage in these, the, the first six series, and we're just excited to be here for the seventh series. It's been a great way to stay connected as a community of leadership educators during this time of, of a pandemic and um, different, you know, virtual learning. So we've been really glad to have this time and space. So we're glad to, ha to have you here. I think we're all pretty familiar with uh, the functionality of Zoom by this point. So I always chuckle when we have this slide up here, but, you know, we will use uh, the chat box um, as we go through our conversations today, um, please go ahead and get started in using that chat feature by letting us know who's here. Tell us your name and where you're joining us from. Um, that way we can get to know each other a little bit. Uh, we'll also use that chat feature if you have questions for either myself or Andy uh, as we go through our time together. Please feel free to drop those in the chat or um, private message us as well if you'd prefer to do that. As we begin our time together, I just wanna read this land acknowledgement and um, acknowledging that the land that each of us is on today is the original homelands of indigenous and tribal nations. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and the forced removal from these territories. And we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous peoples still connected to this land. I ask that you please honor and acknowledge the native indigenous peoples from the land that you are joining us from and give that thought to, to your ancestry and the generations that came before you. So those of you who are for new to leadership, a little bit about us as an organization, we are a not-for-profit organization that's uh, committed to creating a just, caring, and thriving world where all lead with integrity and practice a healthy disregard for the impossible. Um, and one of the ways we do that is by hosting these conversation series. When we look at, and you know, if you Google leadership definitions, there's hundreds and thousands of them, but I wanna provide this one for you all because it's a basis from which we do all of our programming and it'll be a basis from which we engage in our conversation here today. Uh, we really do believe that leadership involves living in a state of possibil possibility, making a commitment to a vision, developing relationships to move that vision into action and sustaining a high level of integrity. We think that effective leadership takes place in the context of a community and it results in a more equitable society. So today in our conversation, we are going to talk about that we're probably average and why that's okay. And uh, I have Andy Bainline with me from the University of Michigan, one of our co-lead facilitators. And Andy, I you got to read Andy's bio as you signed up for this presentation, but Andy, I'd love for you to just introduce yourself and um, then we can go ahead and get started. Absolutely, nice to meet all of you. My name is Andy Bainline. Uh, I got started in this wonderful average work uh, in the world of sketch comedy um, and had a sketch that featured a demotivational speaker talking about be average and, and why be perfect. And then a couple years later, as I kind of transitioned into higher ed, I started thinking a little more about, you know, that maybe he's onto something and, and maybe average is, is actually okay. And hopefully, uh, be able to impart a little bit of average knowledge to you today. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you. I'm very excited to learn some average knowledge and to have this conversation. So as we get started, we've asked Andy to give us, a, to put together some polling questions, find out a little bit about who's here and as we begin to engage in this content. So the first question uh, is, who are you here for? either yourself, your students or employees, or a mix of both. Lots of answers coming in. Mm -hmm. A lot of mix of both. So kind of what expected and kind of great to hear that a little bit of knowledge for yourself and to share it with others. Wonderful. I'm gonna end it so that way people can see the results as well. Perfect. So to set the agenda for today, um, to give you a little bit of insight of how it's going to show up, 
Uh, we're going to set the mood. We're going to talk about why we typically don't want to be average, why we may think that's a bad thing. Um, we're going to talk about why it can be a problem to think that we aren't. We're going to talk about why you probably are average, why it's okay. And if we're not quite there yet, how can we accept that it's okay? But to set things off, I would love in the chat, uh, if you could all tell me what you think it means to be average. What does the word average mean to you? What is your you know, personal definition? Middle of the road, okay. Average is scary, maybe not special, okay. Not the best, but not the worst, absolutely. Average just means getting by, not so good, not so bad, not overly ambitious, nor lazy, okay. Think of the bell curve above the bottom, below the top, mediocre, not special. Perfect, all of these are great definitions and what we're going to work with today. If you could go to the next slide, Kristen. Yeah. So the definition uh, that I kind of use for average is it's not ordinary or common. It's kind of that midway between the extremes. It's not good. It's not bad. It just kind of is. Mm -hmm. And to set the mood a little bit, uh, this is going to be an average presentation. So hopefully get your high expectations down. <laughs> Hopefully you will learn some stuff um, and we'll have a good time. So our next polling question is, I would love to know how average you think you are. How average do you think you are? I love this question. It's probably not a question we've asked ourselves very often. <laughs> Votes are coming in in a pretty expected place. We got everybody. So as expected, as research has shown, uh, most people think they're above average. Uh, some votes in the middle, one vote for below average. And so why is that? Why don't we think we're average? And why don't we want to think that potentially? So. The first reason is that we typically don't know ourselves very well. Uh, there's a concept called illusory confidence that essentially we tend to overestimate our own capabilities. College professors were asked uh, in a study how they compared to other college professors. 94% of them thought they were above average compared to other college professors. Uh, drivers were asked to compare themselves. How good of a driver are you compared to others? 80% of people think they're above average. So we have this tendency to overestimate our capabilities. I definitely know that I am the best driver in the world. Uh, I am too, Andy. It's so <laughs> nice to meet you. I really do believe I am the best driver in the world. Yeah, it's weird how that works. No, wow. <laughs> Uh, the other piece of why we don't want to be average or how that is shaped um, and kind of continues to move in the United States is this culture of striving for perfectionism. So there are three different types of perfectionism that have been studied since the 1980s, uh, comparing different generations of college students. So self-oriented perfectionism, the unrealistic standards we set on ourselves the other oriented, the standards we set on others, and then socially prescribed are kind of the perception of what we think people have standards on us. And so from 1980 to 2016, 
those measurements self-oriented are up 10%, the other oriented are up 16%, and in kind of scary terms, the socially prescribed are up 33%. Wow. So there is a large jump in what we think others expect out of us. Mm. And they think a lot of that uh, has to do with social media, okay. the increase in kind of that keeping up with the Joneses and everyone putting the perfect selfie up, taking 35 pictures and putting the right filter. Um, so that's kind of been interesting to see. And then there's another concept called status anxiety, essentially meaning that in centuries past, we kind of knew where we stood in society. We knew if we were born into X family that we were expected to do this, we were expected to do that, and we kind of knew our place. And now it's not the case as much and that uh, there can kind of be that thought that if we don't jump up, if we don't jump up to the next class or whatever it might be, it's our fault and that mm. we did something wrong. Um, and so these are kind of the main three reasons of why we typically don't want to be average or why we don't think that we are. And so I want to know our next polling question is if this rise in perfectionism is something that you've seen, uh, whether in yourself, whether in friends and family or students, employees, if you've kind of seen that increase as well. People are very quick to respond to this one. <laughs> very quick. Lots of mediums, lots of high. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they really think kind of as uh, just the worldview of people kind of increases with social media and people are able to see not necessarily just around what's in their neighborhood that, you know, they keep needing to get the new and best thing and, and all of that. So definitely not surprising to see those results at all. So once by chance we accept, you know, that maybe we can be average, or maybe we're holding out still a little hope that we're not, uh, it can actually be a problem uh, to not accept it. So the first reason is called the Dunning-Kruger effect. Uh, that kind of goes back to that idea that we overestimate our abilities. That Darwin has this quote, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. And just because someone tells you you're wrong uh, might actually increase their desire to believe that they are in fact right. Mm. Um, and it has kind of been shown uh, on opposite ends of the spectrum. So people who are worse at something will tend to think they are much better at it. And people who are actually very good at things uh, will tend to think they're worse. Mm. And so uh, it's kind of this conundrum of finding that middle ground of understanding, you know, that we know what we don't know. And that's kind of that starting point. The second piece is that there was a study done at Miami University that in the workplace, perfectionists don't actually perform any better or worse. We typically have this thought that working 70, 80, 90 hours a week trying to get ahead um, doesn't actually get you ahead. Uh, that the positive effects that we can have, um, whether it's engagement, whether it's motivation, um, are usually offset by poor mental well being or uh, lots of burnout. Yeah. And I think we see that a lot. Um, I see that a lot with our students, um, just trying to do more and more and more and more. And, you know, eventually you kind of hit that wall and, and don't know what else to do. Right, right. Yeah, I see that a lot in students, right? When they list off a long list of things that they're involved in on campus or leadership roles that they have. And like they talk so long that you're like, are you going to pass out? Because you didn't take a breath from all of those, those things that you're doing. Exactly which kind of brings us to our last point about super chickens. Uh, this is one of my favorite TED Talks that I saw. Uh, there was a Purdue biologist who wanted to see, uh, measure the productivity of chickens. Okay. And so he had two groups of chickens. One group was just kind of your 
average run of the mill chicken. He put a group of them together and then he found the best of the best, the super ultra performing chickens and put them in a group. He left those two groups alone for six generations, uh, found later that the average group was doing well, they were healthy, they had an increased level of productivity, they kind of all worked together and, and moved their chicken home uh, to the next place. And okay. with the super chicken group, only three were alive. <gasps> oh my <made> goodness. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Yeah, uh, they actually pecked each other to death. Uh, it was not a good situation. It took a very dark turn, Abby. <laughs> Absolutely. Took a very dark I wasn't thinking it was going there, but but I see where this is headed now. Yeah. I want to be that, pecked to death. Actually putting our kind of quote unquote ultra performers together can backfire. Um, that and so sounds question like a very big for, backfire. Right. Question for all of y'all in the chat. Have you seen this anywhere? Mm. Do you kind of see this super chicken ultra performers uh, backfiring? Congress. Yeah. So Abby true. says Congress. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Burnout. Absolutely. That constant trying to do one more thing and one more thing. And there's only just so much energy to go around. I think of it, Andy, when I was working on campus, when I would have those, what I would now call super chickens of students who would start brand new organizations and they would get the the ultra performers and they were like, oh, we're gonna start this new organization and it would never make it off the ground, right? Mm -hmm. It would just, you'd be like, okay, are you sure, you wanna get other people involved in that? And they were like, no, because we're the best of the best. Like we should be exactly. able to do that and those organizations would never, would never even make it. Exactly. Seen it with a group with common personalities. Absolutely, everyone trying to do the same thing. And you know, that's why we need our diverse groups that have People have different positions. People have different strengths and getting those in the right idea. Too many big ideas, but not getting the work done. Yes, I had, similar to your story, Chris, when I had a group of four students that I think tried to start like six different clubs that too many ideas that they didn't actually do any of them because they were just trying to get that done. Yeah. Think about honor students working in housing your honors housing become toxic at times. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. There is so much of that. And, you know, it is can be a collaborative environment, but when it becomes competitive, that's when we can have issues. Overcommit can't be successful. Absolutely. On campus, we reward the super chickens. We do. Giving them promotions, putting them in different positions that we think they're going to succeed when that's what everyone else is doing. Yeah. So why are you probably average? Well, frankly, it's statistical. Uh, some have to be above, some have to be to below, be. and some are people in the middle. Uh, they are going to be our low performers, there are going to be our high performers, and there's going to be just our average performers. My favorite study uh, kind of having to do with this is there was a study at the Harvard Business Review and they found that in any organization, um, they span different uh, industries, different schools, different everything, was this similar bell curve and you had your top 20% of people who are going to go above and beyond regardless of who their boss was, regardless of what situation they were, they were just going to do that. At the same time, you are going to have your bottom 20% of people who are going to actively be awful. And in some cases going to actively go against uh, whatever your mission, your vision is of your mm -hmm. company or organization. That's just their personality. And really the group of people that we have to influence is that middle 60%, that middle average group. Uh, and that top 20% can kind of either bring them up with them um, and that way, that's what they saw, uh, tended to have the positive success uh, bringing that group up. Or we kind of have the instance where that 60% is influenced by that bottom 20%. Um, and that's usually what tends to bring them down. And so it's really that middle average group 
uh, that has so much say in these different organizations. The other piece of why you probably are average or in my definition is that people kind of average themselves out. Um, and so while you may be great and phenomenal at one thing, you may not be so phenomenal at another. Uh, that's why I, I love to use the, the concept of the average unicorn, uh, that unicorns are special and these great wonderful things, but there are still average unicorns. They're still probably not very good at some things, but like you can still be a pretty cool average unicorn and that's okay and that's still pretty cool. Mm -hmm. The other piece is that comparison matters so much when we think about all of this stuff and that average and the concept of whether we or others are average really depends on who or what you are comparing. So I would love to do a fun little activity and, and we're gonna test your brains a little bit. So I'm gonna ask you some questions, some comparisons, uh, and I would love for you to vote with your reactions at the bottom. And so I'm going to compare two different people. And if you could put a heart for person A or the little party thing at the end for person B. So question one, you are a basketball coach and you need to give the game winning shot. You're drawing up a play and you need to pick who's gonna get that shot. So player A, has shot 50% in game winning shots and player B has shot 100% in game winning shots. Who are you giving the ball to? Player A with a heart who has shot 50% in game winning shots or player B who has shot 100% in game winning shots with the little party hat thing got lots of party hats, a couple hearts. Well, player A uh, happens to be Michael Jordan, who is nine for 18 in game-winning shots. Player B is Airbud, the dog from the movie Airbud, who is one for one. That's a pretty good Airbud. He was he's pretty, pretty awesome. He was, he was pretty good. <laughs> Airbud never disappoints, true. Airbud never does disappoint. So let's move on to question number two. This is a little bit out there, but aliens are coming down. Aliens are the best at esports, and they developed this new game, and they need one person from Earth to play them in this one new alien esports game. Player A, you need to decide who is playing the alien. Player A, highest world ranking of their game of choice is 345th in the world. And player B's highest ranking in the game of their choice got to number one. Who are you putting against the aliens to save the world? We've got a heart who has raised to 345th or the party hat who have made it to first. Seems like some people might be catching on, but we're still about 50-50. <laughs> uh, player A, whose highest world ranking in the game is Tyler Ninja Blevins, kind of one of the epitome players of esports. He was also on The Masked Singer. I'm not sure why, but like it was still pretty cool. Uh, player B is myself, uh, oh. who was the number one world. There's this weird game app called Dots with a Z uh, that I made it to number one at one point. I do not trust myself to play the aliens. <laughs> we've, got, we've got one more. So person A was fired from their first job for not having any good ideas and bankrupt the first business that they started. And person B developed a variety of new methods used in their industry and has ended their career with a net worth of $5 billion. You're picking a new CEO who are you picking? Person A, who was fired from their first job for not having any good ideas and bankrupt the first business that they started, or person B, who developed a variety of new methods in their industry and ended their career with a net worth of $5 billion? Surprise, it's a trick question. Both of those are Walt Disney. Really? 
Really? Really? Yeah. And so as we think about whether it's being perfect, whether it's thinking about being average, that comparison matters so much of who we are comparing ourselves to, who are we comparing others to, are we comparing our expectations of our current students with maybe that one exceptional student, that mm -hmm. one super chicken who we kind of had do everything for us, or are we putting people uh, in that possibility to succeed? Are we giving people uh, the methods, the, the ideas, the chances that they can really succeed in, in their strengths? So why is it okay, in fact, to be average? First of all, studies have shown that it's better for your mental health. Um, as we talked about um, previously with that perfection, um, that idea that trying to do more and more and more uh, is not good for our anxiety and depression, it turns out. <clears throat> the next piece uh, has to do with trying, um, that they have found that the fear of failure uh, is actually increasing. And so hobbies and people doing hobbies, granted uh, this was before the pandemic, uh, that hobby trying was down in itself because people didn't want to just try new things because they thought they weren't going to be good at it. And so they just didn't do it. Uh, so I would love to know from y'all in the chat, um, does that resonate? Are there things that maybe you have wanted to do, wanted to try, uh, but weren't really wanting to potentially fail right away. And so you just kind of passed on it. That's a really great question. I, I almost wonder, I'm really curious to see how the pandemic in, influences that when we just had no other options, right? Because exactly. I'm probably one of the people, as people are responding in the chat, but one of the people who I don't try hobbies because I, I don't want to fail. I don't like failure. I don't want to fail. And so I, I, I am slow to try a hobby. I definitely found myself more and more this past year of like, you'd look at pictures of all the cool things people were doing. And then, well, I'm not going to start from the beginning. And then you just kind of go from there downloading a new app game and if you're not good at it you delete it within 10 minutes absolutely you know we want to be good at things we're not necessarily used to to failing and and not being able to do mm -hmm. the work to get better at it right and that's what i like about what you just said here is like seeing not seeing fail mistakes as a failure but more as the work to do mm -hmm. <clears throat> Abby's the misnomer and loves trying new things. That is fantastic. Doug will almost try anything once. Absolutely. Like Proud of you. I'm, I'm yeah. not that way. <laughs> I am not I, either. I, yeah. I admire people who are that way. Like, mm -hmm. I really, I'm like, that is so cool. And yet I'm like, mm, I'm just going to watch you from <laughs> right back here. <laughs> Let me know how that goes for you. I hope that goes well. <laughs> I've heard it's good to try everything twice so that way that if the first time either you didn't do it right or didn't have the right circumstances that at least try again so that you can kind of see a second attempt and how that goes. That makes sense, that makes sense. I think the last idea of why it's okay to be average is it allows us to do more quote unquote good work. Voltaire said, perfect is the enemy of good. And it kind of goes back to that idea of trying and just whether it's putting off writing that book or drawing that picture or doing whatever craft. And we, I think, can put ourselves off because we know it's not necessarily going to be perfect, but giving us that option to just do it. Mm -hmm. And whether it's good, good enough, which we'll talk about in a little bit, that it kind of pushes us in that right direction, I think. Yeah, being able to let go of that perfectionism really is very freeing, right? To be able to do, do good work that is needed and whether that's needed for yourself in your own personal development or mental health and just relaxation and wellness or even for students, right? Being okay with doing good work is 
it's it's needed, right? And mm -hmm. how do we continue on that path? Right. So I think kind of the last piece of, of how do we get there and how can we accept by chance being average? So the first thing that folks recommend is expectation management um, and really setting ourselves up to know uh, kind of what the outcome might be and being okay with it. And the method that folks recommend uh, can kind of depend on the perfectionism that people quote unquote suffer from. So for self-oriented perfectionists, uh, it's recommended uh, that they can be helped by others reigning in their expectations and kind of mm -hmm. having them talk through it of like, are we getting ahead of ourselves here? Is there maybe something uh, that might not be this brand new perfect thing, but can we get to kind of that good enough? With other oriented folks of putting uh, that kind of unattainable uh, perfection on others, it can be helped by talking to them uh, about themselves more a little bit and kind of helping reframe uh, the idea that uh, maybe we don't know how others are going to perform and that's okay and that we can set them up for success, but that trying to give them these unattainable deadlines and unattainable goals doesn't really help anyone because we're going to get disappointed in them. Uh, they're going to get disappointed and frustrated. And so trying to set good expectations all around can help. And then for our socially prescribed, uh, that idea of kind of the perceptions coming in from all around us uh, can be a little bit of both. Mm. both kind of talking through what, uh, whether it's a mentor-mentee relationship and kind of sitting them down of like, here's actually what I expect of you. And it's not this big grand thing that I think a lot of times uh, people have, uh, can get out of hand a little bit. Right. Uh, are there things uh, that y'all in the chat um, have been able to use uh, with expectation management and coaching and kind of setting those standards for folks or how you lay those out um, for students that you may advise or things like that. It's a great question. I think when I was supervising students, and I use this too even when I supervise the, the, the staff of like sharing expectations, right? This is my expectation. What's your expectation? And how do we kind of co-create that? And it's always fascinating to see where there is the overlap. And then somehow, if someone's asking me of my own expectations, like I hold my expectations for myself higher than other people would hold of me, right? Mm -hmm. in, um, and I don't know if other people on the call are, are, are like this. Like I'm, I'm really, I'm my own worst critic. And so I always set the expectations much higher for myself than I set for anyone else. And so being able to, to share that with people has always been important to level set me <laughs> at times of like, yep, you don't, you don't need to expect that. We mm -hmm. wouldn't expect that of you. Why are you expecting that of yourself? Exactly, yeah. Chelsea says, clearly defining priorities, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Kind of setting that timeline, that bullet list of here's what actually we need done, not X, Y, and Z that I think sometimes our brains can kind of go off into and making me think of students who will drop a course because they lost the ability to earn an A. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We see that all the time, I think, of if they're not going to get that perfect outcome, then why even keep going? Absolutely. I even see it. So I have small children. I have young children, not small, but I have young children. I even see it in them. Like as they're learning uh -huh. new things, like if they just can't get it right or it's not going to be perfect, they're, they'll crumple it up and throw it away, right? They're like, well, it's not even worth doing if it's not going to be exactly how I want it to be. Mm -hmm. I think it starts at such a young, it can start at such a young age. I think that kind of brings us next point of satisficing. Uh, I'm not sure if people are familiar with that term. Uh, it's the combination of satisfied and suffice. And it's this idea of kind of the best option or good enough or our minimum viable product, uh, as they talk about in the business world, versus maximizing. Uh, but they actually have found that kind of whether it's in uh, home renovations, whether it's in business decisions, whether it's in anything, uh, 
uh, that striving to determine that one perfect outcome can have a lot of harm, uh, can waste a lot of time in trying to figure out um, kind of that one perfect option that isn't always necessarily there. Uh, and if we can find that best option or a good enough option and one that will meet our criteria, um, that they have found that people are a lot more satisfied um, in that decision, um, mm -hmm. both short-term and long-term. And I think uh, we see that a lot in students kind of coming up with these big, bold ideas and kind of talking them down a little bit of still having a successful program, but it doesn't necessarily need to be this $20,000 budget with 10,000 people who are going to show up, uh, that you can still do something pretty good and, and be satisfied with it. Yeah, it's kind of like remembering like, yeah, I am satisfied with it. I didn't know that I wanted anything else. And so this is exactly what I needed and wanted. Yeah, Travis talking about cultural norms of excellent and holding those expectations in white culture, absolutely. Um, and just kind of being there and, and helping folks break that down to measure their own success. Absolutely, I think that is so important, um, just that it is not this one uh, kind of focused definition of success or, or excellent or perfect or uh, whatever that model may be uh, that people can and should have whatever that definition is for them. Mm -hmm. And I think there can be a lot of work kind of even breaking down uh, expectations, whether it's family, whether it's culture, society, of just kind of sitting down and, and wondering, what do you actually want? And you know, what do you actually think uh, is good and good enough, uh, I think is hugely important, absolutely. I think kind of the last uh, thing that I have found uh, in accepting this uh, is actually going against goals. Um, I am a pretty big anti-goal fan because I think uh, they are outcome oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have found that uh, working within processes or systems or trying to get to X, Y, Z, um, I think has helped me a lot. Um, so many people have talked about failure just being a stepping stone to the end goal uh, that I think it can help you whether you're setting a goal of losing weight or something like that, of just kind of focusing on being healthier along the way and not necessarily that end number, or whether in, in my case, kind of trying to start uh, or trying to develop the business and focusing on doing things every day, little steps along the way, and so that you don't just kind of get to the end and think, oh, well, I didn't reach it, and so I didn't actually do anything worthwhile, when in fact, so much was done um, that it just perhaps that that end goal that end outcome wasn't necessarily there what makes me think about when you're focused on a process then you don't miss some of the additional learning or opportunities that might come up along the way when i'm so focused on just the outcome I, you can develop that kind of tunnel vision of all i see is what's ahead of me right so thinking about it even from a student perspective, right? The outcome of planning an event for your organization, all I see is that one piece and I mm -hmm. might miss the opportunity for partnership with other organizations or growth in other areas, right? So I, I appreciate what you're saying about kind of the focus on a process or a system instead of the the end piece because the end piece is really only one of, one of <laughs> hopefully the pieces. You have a lot of things to do exactly. to get to the end piece. Yeah, I think. For, for folks who might have been on yesterday's uh, chat with Natalie talking about joy, mm -hmm. uh, she kind of talked about that too, that uh, just kind of slowing down and being able to focus on the process uh, kind of gives you those small opportunities uh, that I think if we have our head down, uh, kind of focusing on that outcome, we, we can tend to miss. Yeah, absolutely. So some guiding questions, uh, I think, potentially uh, can help us along the way. So one that I would love uh, to pose to you um, right now in the chat, if you have uh, ideas or thoughts on that last one of how can we be more intentional of focusing on the process uh, and not the outcome, uh, whether that's in our, our personal lives, whether that's in the workplace, uh, but really focusing on that process um, and not as much 
the outcome. If y'all have some info or knowledge um, that you'd love to share with the group. can't wait to see what people are thinking as we think about that. And I think it's so important for students, right? If, especially as we think about those super chicken students that we were talking about earlier, right? And helping them, you know, focus on the process, right? And what does that, what does that mean? And then thinking about then the impact that that can have on their own mental health and well-being as well when they're not, when we're not so focused on just the, the outcome. Andy, you mentioned you you don't focus on outcomes. So do you, like when you're looking at a project, do you not, how do you plan that out that you only focus on the process? I think there, it's kind of a balance. Uh, I think there is is certainly some kind of what do I want my outcome to look like and, and some rough parameters. But then I think a lot more of, of kind of back to Chelsea's point of defining priorities Mm -hmm. uh, I think I try to spend a lot more time in kind of breaking down uh, how are we going to get to the outcome uh, versus what the outcome is. Exactly, just kind yeah. of just like Lindsay said, uh, kind of having that uh, end goal or end idea of what we want uh, and then having those two to three process goals for how we want to go about it. How are we going to go uh, from X to Y or, or something like that? Douglas says, if you focus on the process and don't end up with lots of process and fee results. I think sometimes uh, we can get caught up in uh, figuring out or kind of pre-setting what our expectations are when we don't uh, necessarily know what they actually are. Uh, we have a tendency in my department, at least, to, to want to do a program, want to do something, uh, and we don't ask why we want to do it. Mm. Uh, and I think kind of asking those questions of why are we doing it helps with that process as well. Of like, do we just need a program because someone told us to do a program, or what are our actual goals? What are we actually trying to do? Yeah. Yeah. I feel, like, I feel like we'll be asking us uh, asking ourselves, hopefully people will be asking that question more and more as we come out of the pandemic, because it will be very easy. It could be very easy to step back into old routine and old habit of mm -hmm. we did eight events a year. So this year we have to do eight. But what I hear you talking about, Andy, that I really appreciate is the intentional focus on. So why did we do those events? We remove the number potentially from it, but the why behind it. And if I get to understanding the why, then I, I understand them that I am able to focus on the process and then results follow when you when you are in alignment with that. Exactly. Yeah. Our old EVP Royster Harper used to say, do less better um, mm -hmm. and kind of really focus on kind of what we're good at. And so that we're not wasting resources, we're not wasting time, and we're not just kind of spinning around uh, like chickens with our heads cut off. Um, chickens are very relevant in this are being, so relevant. <laughs> in being average. <laughs> I, I will never look at a chicken the same way again, I do not think. Uh, but Royster Harper is, is so wise in those words, right? And doing less better, right? That's, um, that's so wise. Exactly. Travis says, instead of setting huge long-term goals, it can be more beneficial to break it down and focus on the individual steps to take to fill my bucket. Absolutely. I think we can get caught up in that big picture so much and, and setting it down into those individual steps, those smaller goals can absolutely help on that journey. I think one final question that I would love your knowledge on and kind of wisdom is how do we think we can help ourselves with expectation management and not necessarily getting our hopes up so much but kind of right-sizing um, processes and outcomes by chance. How can we help ourselves with expectation management? I'm writing this question down, Andy, because I feel like I need to think more about it as well. <laughs> and maybe other folks do too, but I think for me, part of it is being realistic with what I have the capacity to do. Mm 
-hmm. I think very often I think I have a capacity to do all of the things, but that's not true. Like, Mm -hmm. and so, and when I, when I do that, when I take on too much and others might feel this way, like you are spread too thin and I don't do anything well because I'm doing way too many things. And so thinking truly about what is my capacity and where do I want to contribute my average abilities, right? Mm -hmm. And so what is that? What does that contribution look like? Then I'm able, when I think about that, I can then manage my expectations of myself. Absolutely. Realizing that things on our campus are changing, thinking about programs that we run. Maybe they worked in the past, but students are different now and they may not learn or be interested in the programs that students were interested in a few years ago. Absolutely. I think that is one of the great and awful things about working in higher education as students cycle in and out, that they have different ideas and different plans and different hopes. Um, and What worked with one group may not work with another. Um, mm-hmm. And I think uh, at least myself kind of have a tendency to, to assign blame of, oh, I'm doing something wrong now, or I'm doing X, Y, and Z like I shouldn't be doing when in fact people just change and have different ideas. Right. Yeah, ask how does this fit in with everything else on the plate? How does it or can it? Absolutely, kind of, is it uh, Brene Brown that has the bucket analogy that you can't pour from an empty bucket or an empty glass that, you know, you need to take care of yourself first? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I often remind myself of how hard some things were to do when I first tried doing them, such as driving a stick shift, still can't do it. Uh, I can't do it. You're probably good at it, Abby. (laughs) Abby can. (laughs) And how those things become easier over time. And the expectation is this will be hard unless you work at it. And then it's not. Yes, yes, yes. There are so many different uh, studies of whether it's the 10,000 hour rule that you need to work at something for 10,000 hours to be really great at it or kind of the learning curve of you're not good at it, you're not good at it, you're not good at it, and all of a sudden you're really good at it, um, and that we don't really kind of see those small steps or that Mm -hmm. progression that we're making, and knowing that, and yeah, setting that expectation, Abby, that kind of pre-warning yourself that this is going to be hard, I think can be very helpful, absolutely. It makes me think about if you're learning a skill, right, like taking videos or pictures of when you start and capturing it along the way to mm-hmm. see how you grow. And, and I think about it as I've been you know, watching my children and I have a son who plays baseball and I look back at, the, and he's, he's only seven, but I look back at the way he played baseball when he was four <laughs> or five versus the way he plays baseball now as a seven-year-old. Uh-huh. I'm like, oh, right, you can, you can do different things because you've <laughs> stayed with a skill that you've developed over time. Now, you, he still at four would watch baseball on TV and think he could do the same things that major league baseball players do. He still mm-hmm. thinks that at seven, but he has a comparison of like, well, when I started, I was able to do this. And now two or three years later, I'm able to do something I didn't think I was able to do. And how helpful that would be if I took that same approach for myself of when I start something, this is my first attempt at it. But you know, a year later, here I am still trying it and here this it looks so much different exactly. I don't know if better or worse but maybe different mm-hmm. absolutely perfect thank you all for sharing your wisdom and knowledge uh, kind of the next slide just has some different resources some different articles uh, that are pretty good reads of just kind of uh, explaining whether it's trying or that good enough just might be perfect There are, I think this is uh, an increasing topic, an increasing idea um, that I think are are gaining some momentum. That's wonderful. Thank you, Andy, for sharing these resources. And we will uh, provide these resources when we um, uh, send out the link to the recording. We'll add these to the resource list so that if people want to add this to their summer reading and watching list that you have those resources, especially as you begin to gather again with students and your own staff, the people that you work with on your teams, right? It's, as we get to gather again together in community to start the year out, uh, what a great conversation to be having about what does that, what does average mean for all of us and, and how can you continue to do good work? 
Well, we have just a minute or so left. I don't know if people have a couple minutes. Do people have any questions for Andy or oops, again, things you'd like him to talk a little bit more about or? I believe in you, Travis. <laughs> We are all working to accept our averageness. I feel much better about myself after this conversation. <laughs> it's a little bit freeing. Have you found any connection with imposter syndrome? Yes, 1 billion percent. Uh, <laughs> I think a lot of that uh, they talked about with the illusory superiority or, or confidence uh, in that piece of uh, the people that are actually really good at things think they're worst. Um, and so I think uh, I have found, um, even in just kind of bringing this idea of average to people uh, and people not always being on board because they've been told how great they are and how wonderful they are and special they are. And like, yeah, you can still be that. Um, and uh, you're still not the greatest at everything and there's still room to grow. Um, and I think in that imposter syndrome, kind of building people up and, and being more complimentary, uh, trying to notice the little things, um, I think has, has helped in that. What have you learned about your self-perception in regards to averageness along your personal journey? That is a great question <laughs> uh, that I think I'm rebalancing. Uh, I think uh, kind of when I, uh, kind of got into this a little bit more, I, I found myself going a little more negative than average um, mm -hmm. and not necessarily uh, wanting to put myself out there anymore because others are probably better uh, and have better things to say and can say it in a more eloquent way. Um, and I think kind of rebalancing and I think uh, that whole kind of average unicorn thing has helped even more in that uh, average isn't bad. Um, and I think we have a tendency uh, to assign labels, whether good or bad, to different words. And I think um, kind of even in, in school and grading and you need to get the A, which, you know, used to be this great thing. Um, and now it's just what people expect. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think kind of resetting those expectations and, and that idea that average just is um, that you can still uh, be special in some things. You do still have things to offer. Um, you are still pretty good at things, uh, and um, there are times to step aside uh, and times to put other people's strengths um, kind of in the forefront. Absolutely. Uh, how do you deal with the failure is not an option culture? Oof. Next question, please. Uh, <laughs> <just kidding. laughs> you wanna, you're like, oh, the internet connection's uh, bad. I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I think a lot of that uh, for me has kind of come in in trying to do away with goals as much as possible um, and kind of setting that process and, and that system because failure isn't talked about as much, uh, I think, in those little moments um, that I think we set ourselves up so much for failure when talking about goals, uh, when talking about these kind of unrealistic standards that uh, I think in a lot of cases are arbitrary um, and not necessarily based on on anything and we're still kind of expected to to meet them. And so I think it's it's kind of pushing back and and asking that why of why are we setting this as our expectation? Why is this our goal um, and and kind of hoping to go from there? It makes me think too about who's defining it as failure. Mm -hmm. So like in the cultural piece, it's very similar to who's defining it as success in a, in a dominant cultural narrative, like who's defining it as failure as well too, right? And, and why, why are they, why is that the failure is that definition and, and does it need to be, right? I think that makes me think a little bit about that, Douglas. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all for the questions. And Andy, yeah, thank you absolutely. for your time and your expertise and your brilliance in your averageness. <laughs> And it is, uh, I, I agree with the comments that people are sharing. It's just helpful to hear too about your own personal journey through this and, and what you've learned about yourself and how we all can put that into practice 
as, as well within our own development and in the development of those that we work alongside, whether that's students or staff. Absolutely. So thank you. Um, you know, as for all of you, if, if this is the first time being on one of our virtual conversations, I would be remiss if I didn't say, you know, if leadership can help you all along the way as you are thinking about how to provide programming for your students or your staff, uh, we have resources available to help you with that. So please give us uh, a reach out and connect with us because that's what we love to do. We love to partner alongside people um, to help them be better and to do good work in the, in the world and in their communities. At the same time, um, you know, we are a not-for-profit mission or not-for-profit organization uh, who's we really are looking to help a cause much greater than our own. And if there is, um, if you are able to provide any uh, financial resources and donate, we would always welcome that. Uh, but we also always appreciate just your ongoing support by showing up in these sessions and continuing to stay involved in leadership. So with that, I will wrap up our time together and just thank you all for attending our virtual conversation series. And we will be back tomorrow, um, same time and same, same, same time, same time to talk with our dear friend, Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington. So um, if you all are around tomorrow afternoon during your the noon time central, we will see you back. Otherwise, thank you all so much and have a really great rest of your week. Thank you for joining everyone. Yes, thank you.